This is Anna Swan Bates, the tallest female giant of her generation. But this isn't just the story of the traveling giantess of Europe, but also the tragic story of being born a giant during the 19th century. Anna Haining Bates was born in Nova Scotia on August 6, 1846. Her parents, Anne Graham and Alexander Swan, were Scottish immigrants. Anna was from a large family. She was the third of 13 children, all of whom were average size. Of course, Anna was not one to blend in with the crowd. While some reports claim Anna was an average-sized baby, others believe she weighed 13 pounds from birth. By the age of four, most people agreed she was taller than four feet and weighed more than 90 pounds. By the age of 15, she stood seven feet tall. Although Anna Bates was never formally diagnosed, it was later discovered that she was born with gigantism, a condition caused by a tumor in the pituitary gland, which generates excessive growth hormones. Individuals with gigantism develop swiftly and often have much shorter lifespans. Despite being dealt a difficult hand, fate had planned an exciting life for Anna. Anna Bates' family was very sympathetic to their daughter's unusual condition. It is said that when she outgrew her elementary school desk, her father made a larger one by hand to meet her needs. That wasn't all. He also constructed her an extra-large bed to ensure that she remained as comfortable as everyone else in the house despite her evident differences. Unfortunately, he could not shield her from the outside world, so Anna became a spectacle. As word spread about this little big girl, people in Nova Scotia began flocking to her family's farm, hoping to see Anna. Local newspapers began to print tales about her, further fueling the growing intrigue. One tabloid even called her an infant giantess, so from a young age Anna developed a following, and her family viewed this as a significant opportunity. As farmers, they were used to putting their children to work, and Anna was treated no differently. Anna's rapid growth necessitated the frequent purchase of pricey clothes and shoes. To raise finances, the family decided to put Anna to work by visiting local fairs as an attraction. Unsurprisingly, Anna's childhood touring career has sparked controversy. While her family needed the money, some accused them of exploiting her. Nonetheless, most historians agree that her family remained truly attentive and safeguarded her her at all times by accompanying her on these excursions. Anna wasn't always merely traveling about in her teens. She frequently cared for her younger siblings and attempted to keep herself occupied by reading and pursuing other artistic interests. So, despite her unusual experience, she made every effort to participate in all of the customary activities that other youngsters did. Furthermore, she had a perfectly typical dream. Sadly, it was doomed from the start. Anna genuinely wanted to be a teacher. However, she discovered fresh challenges while staying with an aunt and attempting to further her education in a different city. Anna found the classrooms physically tight due to her stature, and the people on the streets in this unfamiliar city frequently stared at her, making her feel extremely uneasy. This treatment put an end to her teaching aspirations, but happily, better things were on the way for her. Anna's height allowed her to pursue both an education and a job. As she went to America in 1862 and accepted a post as the Nova Scotian giantess at the P.T. Barnum Museum. There she received tutoring and learned to play the piano and sing. The museum provided her with incredible chances, many of which were unheard of at the time. Anna received $23 per week in gold, which is equivalent to $500 today. She was also given a chaperone and the opportunity to earn money by selling photos of her image. Her contract permitted her to retain the rights to those photographs, which was unusual at the time. During her time at the museum, Anna played characters such as Lady Macbeth and engaged audiences in discussions about her experiences as one of the tallest women in history. This experience with the P.T. Barnum Museum was mostly positive for her, since she managed her own narrative rather than simply being gawked at as a sideshow. Unfortunately, these pleasant times at the museum would soon come to an end. In 1865, Anna was caught amid a frightening fire at the museum. The stairs were engulfed in flames, and Anna, weighing approximately 400 pounds at the time, was too large to fit through the window. She escaped with the help of 18 people who carried her. 
Although she managed to escape, the results of the fire were nonetheless heartbreaking because Anna had nothing left. All of her belongings perished in the flames. Interestingly, historians note that while Anna was waiting to escape the fire, she assisted many others in leaving before her, and she was regarded as a hero. This helping gene was undoubtedly ingrained in her, regardless of the cost. Because of her size, Anna traveled the world extensively. She traveled extensively around Europe and the United States, only seldom returning to her Nova Scotian roots. Her attractive charm led her to make friends with one of the most prominent royals of the period. In 1863, she befriended Queen Victoria while traveling Europe as an attraction, and the two became unexpected friends. Despite her unconventional appearance, Anna attracted a large number of suitors. She claimed to have had multiple proposals, but she declined them due to her vocation as a performer. It was difficult for her to tell when someone was sincere and when they were just looking for a chance at some of her money. But eventually, she met a man who helped her believe in true love. While visiting a circus in Halifax, Anna couldn't help but notice Martin Van Buren Bates, a man who was likewise over seven feet tall and weighed 500 pounds. It's a timeless story. Every prince needs his princess, and every giantess needs her giant. Anna married Martin in London in 1871, after falling madly in love and embarking on a circus tour together. As previously mentioned, Anna became friends with Queen Victoria while traveling. Following the death of her husband, Prince Albert, in 1861, the queen went into a deep despair and grieved for the remainder of her life. However, the queen's personal sorrow did not lessen her admiration for other people people's love stories. When the news spread in 1871 that Anna had found love, Queen Victoria decided to do something special for her. She presented the entertainer with a bridal gown composed of 100 meters of satin and 50 meters of lace adorned with orange blossoms. And the goodies did not end there. According to rumors, Queen Victoria arranged for the Bates wedding to be held at St. Martin in the Fields Church. It's unclear whether this is entirely accurate, but the story of the two women's unexpected friendship remains an intriguing bit of folklore. Speculation notwithstanding, there were undoubtedly more gifts in store for Anna, courtesy of the Queen. Anna Bates returned to Buckingham Palace when Queen Victoria invited her to visit, and she was given a diamond cluster ring. The bridegroom also received a gold watch and chain. The pair went on to meet the queen at least twice more, as well as other royals along the road. A year after their wedding, Bates and her new husband bought a house in Seville, Ohio, with unusual height requirements to accommodate their enormous statures. More than 150 years later, Anna and Martin remained the tallest married couple in history, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. Their aggregate height exceeds 15 feet 8 inches, which surpasses the current tallest living married pair by about 2 feet. Life had not always been easy. Anna and Martin conceived their first child in 1871 when they were still newlyweds. On May 19, 1872, Anna gave birth to a baby girl weighing 18 pounds. Tragically, the girl did not survive childbirth. Anna was devastated by the death, and she would suffer similar losses later in life. She became pregnant with a son in 1878. On the 18th of January 1879, her water broke, and she lost six quarts of fluid. She was in for an extraordinarily difficult labor. According to Martin, the baby boy weighed 23 pounds, measured 30 inches long, and appeared to be a normal six-month-old child at delivery. Sadly, this was another hopeless birth, as the boy passed shortly after being born. After his death, the baby boy was awarded the Guinness World Record for the largest infant ever recorded. Anna was distraught by her second loss, and the repercussions were severe. After losing two children, she sank into a profound melancholy. She no longer wanted to be on tour and withdrew socially to deal with her distress. In many respects, this was the beginning of the end. Anna and her husband opted to live a more peaceful life in the late 1870s. By the spring of 1880, she had devoted almost all of her time to the farm she co-owned with Martin. They also became deeply involved with the Baptist Church, attending services and reading the Bible on a regular basis. Their church had customized seats erected to ensure the couple's comfort when attending. Anna also began teaching Sunday school at the Baptist Church, so her childhood desire of being a teacher was finally realized in an incredible 
possible way. Anna passed away of heart failure while sleeping in 1888, one day before her 42nd birthday. She was buried in Seville, Ohio. Seville continues to remember Anna and Martin. There is an exhibit in town that is dedicated to the couple that includes mementos from their lives. There is also a museum in Anna's hometown in Nova Scotia dedicated to the giantess. Descendants of Anna's maintain the museum and offer tours to visitors. Let us know what part of Anna's story is the most interesting to you. And if you like entertaining historical content like this, make sure to subscribe to our channel.